My name is Sabrina Hansen, and I'm actually one of the many purpose-driven members here at Embark Behavioral Health. And I'm going to be helping guide this session today. So the topic is healing from the inside out, transferable attachment with animals. And unfortunately, our original speaker, Gina Osborne, really wishes that she could have been here today. However, she is not feeling well and lost her voice. And so I hope that we can all send her some really positive vibes because I know that she would have wanted nothing more than to be here. But we still have what we hope is a very valuable presentation in store for you that will be co-facilitated by our chief clinical officer here at Embark Behavioral Health, Rob Gent. So Rob, if you want to wave to everybody, I know you'll be doing an official introduction. And Scott Kinnicky, who is our director of neurotherapies and works with Gina Osborne, and he is the, um, again, director of neurotherapies at Kalo Programs. So the question for everyone today is, what do golden retrievers, interpersonal biology, and the heart have in common? Scott. Take it away and tell us a little bit about maybe what the answer to this very thought-provoking and intriguing question might be. I would love to. Um, so let me go ahead and share the, pro the PowerPoint presentation here so that you guys can see my screen. Beginning. So first, let me talk a little bit about myself. Um, so as kind of Sabrina said, I am the neurotherapy director here at Kalo Programs. And what that essentially means is, is that um, I oversee all of the centrally nervous system based interventions. And so when I say central nervous system based interventions, um, I'm not, I'm talking very directly, uh, what are the interventions that are affecting the brain itself? So I oversee like neurofeedback, um, direct stimulation, cranial electrical stimulation. Um, I do QEGs, we do brain assessments, we do brain maps. Um, so that's really my forte. So when it comes to the information that I have available, it's really about the brain and how we affect the brain directly. Um, so Sabrina, do you wanna introduce Rob? Yes, so Rob is our Chief Clinical Officer at Embark Behavioral Health, and like me, you might have seen him on some of our past webinars, but is um, an amazing wealth of resources and information, and so um, I'll let Rob explain a little bit about his why and why he feels like this topic is so important. Thanks, Sabrina. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am just was heartbroken that uh, our original presenter um, is not feeling well, but rather elated to be able to do this. Way back in 2007, we began one of our first programs, Kalo, and um, began to bring in canines as a way to work with um, adolescents and preteens who were really struggling with emotional and behavioral dysregulation. And we quickly found through the research and uh, through practical experience is that canines, particularly golden retrievers, who had shown to be uh, the most relational of most of the breeds, um, were incredibly effective with helping the students to regulate, to be able to co-regulate, and then be able to move into caregiving relationships with them. And eventually we happened to work a program that they would work towards adopting the canines themselves and being caregivers. Really quite transformational. So for me, there's a bit of personal story to this. Um, you'll notice this first slide, it says healing from the inside out, transfer a bull attachment. Uh, everybody hopefully can appreciate the play on words here. <laughs> We're going to talk about this, but this picture on here was actually my dog that I had adopted from Kalo way on. His name was Bo, and he was with us for amazing nine years. And so it's just, I know that I get to experience what's happening with me and my breath and what's happening with me neurophysiologically when I even look at this picture. And remember that the relationship I got to have with this dog was, was quite profound. So 
excited to be with you guys today. We're going to talk about some of the science and tie it into some uh, actual stories of, of kids. So really excited to have Scott with us. So Scott, if you don't mind going to the objectives. So what we're really going to be addressing today is three primary things. Really looking at, we're going to use the term relational regulation. It's really essential that we understand what's happening, the science between the relationship between the canine and the client to be able to regulate, to open their window of tolerance and that regulation window to be able to make movement that happens through this dyadic, we'll call it the dyadic experience, which is really quite fascinating in any animal assisted therapy, but we're just gonna focus on canines today. And that'll allow us to move into talking about transferable attachment. This is a really great term because we early on found out that these kids who are dysregulated emotionally, neurobiologically, relationally, behaviorally, through experiences, repetitive, reliable experiences with the canine, that they could practice. It was much easier to practice this relationship where there was unconditional acceptance from the canine. They could then practice that in a safer way with less threat from a caregiver, and then eventually be able to generalize and transfer that, those attachment, secure attachment principles to human adult relationships, to other caregivers, which is super exciting because that is the essence of healing. When we talk about the development of the self, it really is about we need secure attachment in relationships. And then finally, we'll tie it all in with regulating the heart and talk about the science. We'll dip into heart rate variability. So I'm really excited to have Scott be a part of this presentation. Um, so Scott, let, let's, let's climb into the topics. Perfect. So whenever it comes to kind of the psychological components of anything that I do, um, I always kind of have this filter. And my filter is, what's the biology doing? What's the nervous system doing? So in this particular topic, what I want to do is I really want to go into, okay, what, what is interpersonal biology? And then what's going on biologically here? Like what is what are the mechanisms that are interacting with this transferable attachment? And what are the mechanisms that are really um, kind of facilitating these, this transferable attachment? So here I just kind of have a, a basic summary. We're going to first start with the heart. We're going to go over that. I'm going to give you some information about heart rate variability and uh, kind of what that looks like and, and how to do self-regulation with the heart. And then we're going to talk about the interpersonal neurobiology related to the heart. So what we'll see, though, is with interpersonal neurobiology, we're going to literally affect the canines with our physiology. And then that's going to facilitate transferable attachment. So let's start by talking about the heart. So this particular slide is going to be about something that we do here at Kalo called heart training. And heart training is really, um, in essence, is about self-regulation. But it, the way that we implement it here is through groups and through interpersonal dynamics. We do it together. Uh, we, we help people to kind of to do it, you know, just on their own. There's a, there's a very relational dynamic here. And so I'm going to go over the steps. So the first step is what I call heart focus. And heart focus is really, it's kind of a mindfulness technique. It's this kind of concept that, you know, our minds are thinking about a hundred things any given moment in time. You're thinking about, you know, conversations that you've had. You're thinking about lists that you have to do. You have, you're thinking about all the emails that you have to respond to. And so heart focus is really about reorienting your attention on your heart. And so you can do this a couple of ways. You can do this, you know, literally by taking your attention and focusing it on your heart. Um, I like to think of like the three-dimensional space of my heart. I get real anatomical when I, when I do this. Um, for our kids, a lot of times it's really important to get some type of, type of tactile compression uh, because they have these kind of disconnections from their bodies. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll literally just ask them to take their hand and put it on their chest or I'll have them kind of take their fingers and put it on their you know, neck or their wrist. Um, but really what the, the point of heart focus is, is it's to bring the attention to the heart. And that's step one. Step two is really the, the bread and butter of this, which is really about the breath. 
it's very, very important that when you do heart breathing, that you pace your breath. Uh, usually what I'll say is, you know, breathe in for four, breathe out for four, breathe in for four, breathe out for four. And this really is what's going to change the state. And we'll get into a little bit more about that later about state changes. But um, there's a concept that I like to talk about here called uh, state dependent learning. And state dependent learning is this idea that we encode memory into particular states. So the example is, um, you know, um, the kind of funny example is if I, you know, learn to play pool when I'm drunk, that when I am, you know, when I go and I play pool, I'm really only good when I'm drunk. Or another one would be like, um, if I get into an argument with my significant other, um, I start to get, ang you know, that anger and that irritation. And then I can remember every single thing that they've ever done uh, throughout time that, uh, that annoyed me or irritated me. And the reason for that is because we encode memory into particular states. So with heart breathing, what we're doing is we're trying to change our state. We're trying to get into a more regulated pattern, a more coherent pattern. And we'll look at the, the physiology in a minute about what that looks like. We're trying to get our, our heart into a more regulated pattern, which changes our state and literally when that happens, we're going to release certain neurochemicals into our body, endorphins into our body, and then we're gonna change our state and we have access to more positive memories and positive experiences. So that kind of leads us into heart feeling and heart feeling is really about this. Um, there's something called the negative habitual bias. And the negative habitual bias is essentially the idea that about 80% of the time, we're typically thinking about negative things, um, you know, um, worrying and ruminating and perseverating. And is this going to be helpful? And is this going to be useful? And did I turn off the, the lights? And did I turn the oven off? And, you know, there's this constant kind of worry that we as humans tend to find ourselves in. And so heart feeling is really this idea that we have to be really intentional about accessing positive memories, positive feelings, positive experiences. And so with this step, what I ask people to do is to, to literally recall positive memories. And what I mean by that is something where they've experienced love or joy or connection or kindness or something like that. Um, something very, you know, very memorable, you know, people will talk about their children, you know, being born or they'll talk about, um, you know, spending time with their father and fishing. And what's interesting about this is that when I ask, you know, what was your positive memory after we do this, about 98% of the time, the positive memory is something relational. It's something about, you know, your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister, or your loved one, or your child or your canine. And for our, for our kids, um, there can be some complications here. And one of the complications is, is because they're struggling with developmental trauma and attachment, it's hard for them to have positive memories about people. And so it's not unheard of for me to, to say, you know, to be working with a student and to say something like, hey, let's, um, you know, what was your positive memory or think of a positive memory. And they say to me, well, Scott, I don't have a positive memory. So at first, you know, there's kind of a moment where I have to kind of, you know, brace myself from the shock. But after that, really the way that I approach that is I approach that as, as an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to really um, coach them and potentially create a positive memory. So I'll give you an example. Um, one day I was, so I'm at Lake of the Ozarks and Lake of the Ozarks is we're on a lake. And so we do, you know, adventure therapy and we, we have boats and we go out on a lake and we do all that kind of stuff. And so I'm sitting there with one of our students and we're on the edge of uh, the edge of the lake and there's a canine with him. This canine was named Sergeant. And uh, just out of nowhere, just Sergeant just, just beelines it straight for the lake, jumps into the lake, just swimming, laughing, splashing, just kind of this, just this, this ebullience of excitement. And I, I turn over and I look over at the, at the student and he's just laughing and giggling and smiling. And so this is one of the students that, you know, said that he didn't have a positive memory. And so I, I kind of just elbow him a little bit. And I kind of nudge him. I go, 
is this a positive memory that we're creating right now? Is this something that we can think about in the future? So he kind of laughs and, you know, says, yes, God, this is, of course, yeah, this is a positive memory. And so what that does is that allows me to, in the future, whenever I spend time with him, I can remind him of that. Again, if we go back to that negative habitual bias, we're constantly thinking about negativity. And for our kids, there's also a lot of self-deprecation that goes into that. You know, I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm a failure. I'm not lovable. I'm not, you know, attractive or smart or I'm a failure. And so anytime I can really encourage them or I can kind of help them to, to connect with that positive memory, um, I'm, I'm going to do that. Okay, so those are the basic steps of, of the heart training. And you guys can see this, this image of, um, you know, this is one of our students and she's got a canine with her. And this is just a great example of like how I integrate canine therapy with neurotherapy. Um, and there's something really fascinating about canines um, that I've observed over time, which is, is that, um, and, th and myself included, and probably a lot of people here can relate to this, but when you, when you enter into the room with, with a dog, it's almost as though like, if you like dogs, you just kind of turn into a little kid or you just kind of, you get excited or you get kind of, um, you know, there's a sense of wonder and you want to go play with the dog and pet it and your voice kind of tends to go up an octave. Um, so we use that to our advantage in the neuro department. And so we would bring uh, canines into our neurofeedback sessions and whatever we're doing. And what would happen is, is that the, the student would be more receptive to the training. They would be more relaxed. Um, it would give them kind of a sense of safety. And in that sense of safety, they were able to actually train better in the neuro department. So this is just a, a really great example of a neuro training combined with, with canine therapy. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit into the science here. Um, this is from HeartMath, this is from Raul McCready. And what he did is he basically looked at something called the interbeat interval. And what the interbeat interval is, is it's basically, um, you know, when we get our beats per minute, you know, if you're kind of in the gym and you're trying to get your BPMs or you've got an Apple Watch that's monitoring your BPMs, what it's doing is it's getting an average over time, um, typically about a minute. So the reality is, is that our heart rate, our heart rate changes in speed every second. So, um, you know, in this moment, your heart rate's going to go up a little bit and it's going to go down and it changes in the interbeat interval. So what heart rate variability is doing is it's essentially, it's measuring the changes in the speed of your heart rate from second to second. So what happens is, is the ideal condition is that when you breathe in, you want your heart rate to go up because you want your, your heart to distribute oxygen throughout your system, all right? So you want the maximum amount of oxygen to go into your body. When you breathe out, uh, you want your heart rate to go down because there's just carbon dioxide in your lungs and you don't want that to be distributed. So the, the ideal conditions for your heart rate variability pattern are, it goes up when you breathe in and it goes down when, it, when you breathe out. So if you can see here, and the right side where it's under where it says love and appreciation, this is the pattern that we, we ideally want. And what this pattern really indicates is that your body is renewing, it's restoring, it's regulated, it's resilient, um, it's experiencing stability, um, it's within the window of tolerance, it, it, it basically facilitates social engagement, all those types of things. Now, if you look over to the left, you can see that there, these are some examples of some erratic heartbeats. Um, these are heartbeats that you know, tend to be going up and down in, in, a, in just kind of an irregular pattern. So when our heart rate is producing that particular pattern, typically we're in a state of frustration or resentment or anger and irritability. If you look up in that kind of top left quadrant, you can see that the heart rate is actually increasing in beats um, as, you know, as it progresses. And that would be an indication that, you know, cortisol is flowing and adrenaline is pumping and your heart rate's going up. And so that particular pattern would be related to anxiety and anger. So what we do with the heart training is we're really trying to get the body into that kind of heart rate variability pattern of love, appreciation, connection, and pride. And it's in that particular state that we have the most resilience and we have the most, um, you know, the less amount of stress. Okay, so 
this is really just an example of kind of, um, you know, when someone starts to do that heart training, right? So they, they, they engage with that, that very intentional breath pattern. And so if you look at underneath the coherent state on the left side, you see kind of just this irregular pattern. It looks very fuzzy. It's, you can't really discern any of the different frequencies or waves. Um, the respiration is erratic. The blood pressure is erratic. And then right in the middle where that line is, is where the person begins to intentionally breathe. They pace their breath. And you can see that there is this very, very clear change in the heart rate variability pattern. So um, just kind of a side note here, something, um, so I'm also a trained therapist. And so in some cases for you, I know there's a, you know, a lot of mental health practitioners out there. What I find is, is that when I'm working with kids, um, oftentimes I will measure my heart rate variability pattern after a session. And what I find is, is most of the time it's very erratic. And a lot of the times what I'll do is I'll spend about two or three minutes, you know, and I have the luxury of being able to measure my heart rate variability, but I'll spend about two or three minutes regulating my breath to get back into this coherent state before I go and I work again with another student. And the reason for that is I find that um, it allows me to kind of detach from the previous one and then to reconnect. So I'm not kind of thinking about the past session when I'm with someone else. Scott, so when you, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. We had a really great question that came through that could probably provide a little um, additional insight into what you're talking about. But what technology is used to track this heart rate variability pattern data? Yeah. And you can talk a little bit about if it's live or if it's like post, I know you talked a little bit already, but just a, a quick question, maybe to provide some clarity. Yeah, so I'll give you a quick a quick answer there. Um, so what we use most of the time and what a lot of people use, and, and even these are kind of integrated into our watches now, is just um, like Fitbit and you know Apple Watch, they have uh, what's called a plasmograph. And a plasmograph is basically a laser that um, you know shoots through the blood vessels. And then when there's a movement in the blood, it's going to be an indication of a beat. So we're just using a, pl a plasmograph on the ear or on the finger. And actually, I could put up a website that can, can kind of show you guys some of that stuff. OK, um, so something that's really interesting about the heart and about electricity and something that you know, I'm kind of learning is this something called uh, cardioelectromagnetic communication or interpersonal neurobiology. And what that what those terms are really mean is they're just kind of fancy ways of saying that we affect each other emotionally, which, you know, probably most of you kind of know and goes without saying, but we affect each other emotionally. So if I were to walk into a room and a bunch of people are anxious, there's a high probability that I'm going to experience anxiety. Or if I walk into a room and everyone is relaxed, you know, I might walk in and I might kind of whisper or I might kind of like tiptoe a little bit. So there are, there are effects that people have on each other emotionally based on their emotional states. And so something that heart math um, you know, talks about is this electromagnetic field that gets created. And electromagnetic field fields are created in any scenario and situation where there's electricity. So there's electromagnetic fields running through the walls right now based on electrical currents. Um, that are just traveling down the wires, but the heart itself and the brain and actually the muscle structures, they're electric, electrical chemical reactions. So our bodies literally create these electromagnetic fields. And so what, what uh, heart math is discussing is, is the idea that we, act, we can actually pick up on other people's heart rates when we're close to them. Um, like, so if you're standing within about four feet of them that you can actually feel that to some degree. And so um, if we look at kind of the, the usefulness of this, this really has a lot to do with, um, you know, being able to communicate non-verbally in order to protect ourselves. So it becomes very useful um, if let's say a bunch of people are anxious and there's a very good reason for why they're anxious for me to be affected by them and to become anxious myself, because then what happens is now I can mobilize and I can protect myself and I can activate my anxiety you know, in, in order to, to, to meet the demands of some situation. So interpersonal neurobiology is really this idea that our physiologies are going to affect each other. And so this is just a very clear example of this. So this is, um, this is a man and a woman, and this is actually their heart rate variability patterns when they are sleeping next to each other. 
So what's happening here is, is that their heart rates are literally in training to each other when they're, you know, when they're sleeping at night. So our physiologies will entrain to each other, meaning they will synchronize or they will, um, they'll, they'll kind of replicate um, to match each other. Okay, so uh, what we got here is, is um, we're looking at kind of the brains of canines. And what we've found and what we've discovered is, is that actually the brains of canines have a very robust limbic system that looks very similar to a human's limbic system meaning that they're, they're picking up on a lot of the, the kind of interpersonal neurobiological cues that, that we pick up on. So when you talk about you know, body language and prosody, the way that you say things, um, how you say them, the intensity of the way that you say them, um, even the heart rate patterns, you know, all those types of things, dogs are gonna be affected by that. So humans and dogs can interact on this emotional level. You know, so here we have areas of the brain previously thought unique to humans lit up when dogs heard human voices and, and emotional human sounds like crying and laughing. So they respond to the same things that we respond to. And so the results of this study strongly suggest that dogs are very good at tuning into the feelings of their caregivers, which would be us and, and each other. So here is a great example of that. And what we're seeing here is I'll explain this. We're looking at the EKG. So this is not a plasmograph. This is actually an EKG. So this was uh, sensors on the chest. Like if you were to go to a hospital and they were to look at your EKG, they would put sensors just kind of on your chest. Same thing with the canine. They actually, they actually hooked the canine up to an EKG. Um, and they measured the heart rate variability pattern of the boy. And then they measured the heart rate variability pattern of the dog simultaneously. And so what you find here is, is that in this particular instance, um, the dog and the, the boy were separated and then they came together and then they were separated again. And what we have here is, is that you can see that for this first part, we're seeing an erratic heart rate variability pattern on the left side and then on the bottom. Um, and that's an indication that they're separated. So then they enter into the room and, you know, Mabel is the dog and Josh is the little boy and it's, they, you know, they get together and they're hugging and petting and all that kind of stuff. And you can see just instantly that the heart rate variability patterns start to become more coherent. And not only that, but they're synchronizing. So the heart rate variability pattern of the canine and the heart rate variability pattern of the, the boy are synchronizing. And then they leave the room and then the heart rate variability patterns become asynchronous again. So what this is clearly showing is, is that there is a relationship between the heart rate variability pattern and the connection, the relationship between the, the dog and the boy. Okay. Okay, so at Kalo, um, we, uh, we do these kind of little heart rate variability exercises. And in this case, I'm going to show you a video and I'm going to have to kind of tool around and, uh, to, to change the display. But essentially what we're going to be looking at here is we're going to be looking at um, a bunch of our girls. Um, actually, one of our girls is going to be facilitating the heart rate variability here. And um, what I want you guys to pay attention to is the, the, this kind of mirroring effect between the girls and their canines. Um, so give me a second here. I'm going to have to unshare and then reshare the screen. Scott, I am also wondering, in all this excitement and moving of the screens, we can only see half of your face. And so if at the same time that you're doing the video, I don't know if you can adjust the camera a little bit because we oh, want to sure. see all of you. You're so engaging and dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of the problem. Awesome. Great. All right, here we go. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this. Whoops. Okay, so here we have, let's go right here. She's facilitating the heart training. You can see just kind of the mirroring effect here. Her canine is very, very relaxed. Um, now here we have these two girls, and what we've got here is we've got um, 
this is actually both of them are kind of anxious. You can see kind of she's smiling there. She's kind of looking around the room like this is weird, which in some cases it is. <laughs> it can be kind of weird. Um, but you can see kind of the nervousness. And if you continue to watch her canine, you're going to see some restlessness here. And then this girl over here, again, we're seeing some restlessness on the right side. If we go over here, you can clearly see kind of a mirroring effect here. Um, you know, this person here, this student is, is regulating through this heart training. And you can see her, her canine is very, very regulated. And then that's just very, very clear. Um, we had actually done this a couple of times. So if you do heart training and you start to get a little tired, there's a strong possibility that you might be sleep deprived. Um, so usually when I say that and, you know, like with people, they'll be like, oh yeah, I have a toddler or something like that. There's always kind of this, this reason. But usually if you do heart training and you do it well, and you have some sleep deprivation going on, you're gonna get tired. In this case, clearly the canine is gonna mirror that effect as well. And I, I, I'm not sharing the sound here, but if you were to hear the sound, you would, you would hear this student kind of going through those steps, going through step one, um, you know, focusing on the heart, step two, breathing and pacing your breath, step three, coming up with some type of positive memory. Okay, so um, this is all in well. This is, this was, this particular instance was, um, you know, we had kind of, this was a little bit contrived. So I wanna show you guys another video. And this video is um, our canine director here at Kalo Programs. And she's actually gonna facilitate this in one of the canine sessions. So I'm gonna kind of share, I'm gonna unshare my screen here. Oh, wait, maybe I can just go directly into it. Share here. And maybe Sabrina, can you tell me if you see a new video? I can see it. Okay. If any of you in the audience are not able to see it, please feel free to write it in the chat and I can let Scott know. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna kind of narrate this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to try to expand it to. Okay. So initially when, when uh, we start in the fun zone, a lot of times what we do is we do this kind of initial play, which is we let the dogs just kind of run around and we let them kind of, you know, jump and, you know, just kind of wrestle with each other a little bit. And it's just to get, just to get a lot of that energy out. You can see that, um, you know, they're just kind of running around here. And this is very intentional because a lot of times the dogs, when they get into the fun zone, they just want to play. But it's also um, this playful experience is very regulating for our kids. When we get to see the dogs just run around and play, you know, my experience of it is, is that it's like kind of fun and exciting and they're jumping. We're just getting this kind of play experience. I think at one point they just, they create this like pile yeah. <laughs> and there's there is uh, Gina that she's our canine director. Okay, so I'm gonna um, actually I'm gonna make it smaller so I can fast forward it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fast forward it to the part where we we start to do the heart training. Go a little forward here. Okay. Okay, so you can see kind of there's this calming effect. Everybody's kind of getting settled. Um, one of the dogs I think had to use the restroom and he was just very, very kind of unsettled there, that guy right there in that bottom. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward it just a little bit more here. Just notice kind of that tactile compression. So again, usually with the girls or with any of the students that, that kind of putting your hand on, on your heart becomes very, very useful. 
again, a lot of our kids, they become very disconnected from their bodies. Um, that's one of our main, you know, defense structures against, you know, implicit memories and painful memories and painful perceptions is to disconnect from the body. And so in this particular case, what we're seeing is um, seeing them put their hands on their chest, engaging in the heart training here. Everybody's just becoming more relaxed. And again, like if we, we think about the physiology at this point, what's happening is, is that, you know, and the, the hearts of these girls and the hearts of the, the dogs are becoming more coherent. They're becoming regulated. They're becoming more stable. Um, there's gonna be a lot more tolerance for uh, stress. There's gonna be a lot more uh, tolerance for maybe misbehaving of the canines when they're actually trying to, um, to get the canines to do specific things. And it just creates this more resilience and more stability. Okay. And so this, I love this because once they all kind of stand up, they're just, with the exception of that one in the bottom right corner, which has, she has to, we found out she had to go to the bathroom, but um, everybody's just very relaxed. Everybody is very just kind of stable and calm and the rhythms are very low. When we, when I first introduced uh, heart rate variability and, and heart training to the milieu, the canine department just, just flew with it. And the reason is because of this, because when you do a heart training, while you have all the, the, the canines and the students, it just tends to regulate things. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation and I'm gonna show you one more thing. And the last thing I wanna show you is kind of a little pilot study that we did. Uh, okay, a second here, all right. And Sabrina, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about now is um, this pilot study that we did here at Kalo. And, and the way that this pilot study was constructed was we had someone come in, we sat them down on a couch and we measured their heart rate variability pattern. So just sitting there measuring their heart. Oh yeah, hold on for one second. Um, I still have the volume in this video in the background. It's distracting me. So uh, they sat down on a couch and they were just, they were instructed to just uh, kind of stare at the wall like they're watching TV, you know, very boring, not very interesting, not very entertaining. And we measured their heart rate variability over a five minute period of time. Then what we did is we had, a, we had a canine come in, we had them sit up on the couch with them, lay their head um, in their lap. And then the, the person was instructed, the student was instructed just to pet the canine. Um, I, I think in most of the cases, they would kind of look, you know, look into their eyes, um, you know, smiling and giggling and all that kind of stuff. But then for the actual recording, they were just petting the canine. And so we've got two cases where we're looking at, you know, we're looking at our students' heart rate variability pattern without the canine and with the canine. And so this top image here, again, the, uh, the heart rate variability pattern, this left, the y-axis is gonna be beats per minute. Um, so you can see how that changes over time. That's the heart rate variability. And then the, the x-axis is gonna be time. And this top one, you can see that it's very kind of small and, um, you know, there's a little bit of variation here in terms of amplitude, it gets a little bit larger. And this is the baseline. This is the heart rate variability. The top one is that baseline. And then down at the bottom, you can see very, very clearly that the, that the heart rate variability pattern changes quite a bit. You can see that there's more amplitude. You can see that, that, that actually there's more coherence, meaning that the, the heart, the lungs are working better. Um, you know, this person is experiencing emotionally um, more positive emotions. They're experiencing that kind of love and connection and kindness and joy or, you know, whatever kind of subjective positive experience that is. But there's a very, very clear relationship between the first recording and the second one. And then the second one is this one. So again, at the top here, we get this heart rate variability pattern. Um, you can see some erratic kind of increases of heart rate. And, you know, here it's very small. 
And then this one is actually very profound. If you look down at the bottom, this is the post recording. This is the recording when they were spending time with the canine. You can see that there's very large amplitudes. Like think of that as like, um, you know, like vasodilation, like there's a relaxation uh, factor that's taking place. Um, the person's body is filling up with more oxygen. Their, you know, their nervous systems are coming more online. Um, there's just a brightening effect that's going on here when, when the, uh, the canine is sitting with the person. So we know very clearly that the canines are affecting the heart and they're, they're affecting the heart in very positive ways that contributes to more social engagement and less defensive tendencies. So just a very, very interesting study. Okay, I think this is the end, or um, maybe Rob, do you wanna kind of, you wanna take it now and just kind of summarize this, these takeaways here? Yeah, I would appreciate that, Scott. Scott, thank you so much. Just a, a bunch of data that's indicating that the canines actually do impact us, what I would call neurophysiologically. It's impacting our heart. It's impacting our nervous system. Um, especially as a mental health practitioner, as a therapist for years, I know even myself have tended to do talk therapy, and it's been this sort of cognitive exchange and utilizing animal-assisted therapy, but utilizing canines. Now we have some science behind the fact that what we're doing is we're taking that relationship we're actually calming the nervous system, calming, we're synchronizing, we're getting that robust variability. And the bottom line is what? We're actually making it safer, safer for these kids and these clients to do what? Integrate trauma, to be able to have a coherent narrative, to be able to transfer those experiences to now safe human relationships. I mean, who doesn't feel this unconditional acceptance from a canine? I mean, just looking at those pictures, you can see the canine looking at you with this sense of unconditional positive regard. To be able to then transform that, transfer that into caregiving relationships is really what begins to have this integrated healing, cognitive, emotional, physiological. So I, I really, really appreciate us talking about this fascinating stuff. So maybe one question, Scott, is this has been amazing, but how, how, how do I take this home with me? How, how do I do this in a practical sense? Because you have all this, these tools and these mechanisms. Is there a way to get out this without having all of this resource? Oh, absolutely. I would say probably the, the, two, the, the two main things to know is one that, you know, doing a heart training, being able to take a moment of time and really just be intentional about your breath for a minute, allowing yourself to kind of think about positive memories, think about gratitude, think about connection, think about those types of things are gonna be really useful for your own regulation, for one. And then two, being able to do that with, you know, people who are struggling, people who are struggling and have challenges with stress and defensiveness and doing that with them, you know, that's gonna be a huge, huge piece. Um, and that's very easy to do. You know, you just kind of follow those steps, you know, that, that heart focus, focus on your heart, heart breath, focus on your breathing, just breathe four in, four out, and then come up and recall some type of positive memory in your life. Very simple, very easy thing to do um, and very effective. Um, if you were to do that, say three times a day, literally, um, it would improve your mood and it would improve, improve those types of things. Um, the second would be that you know, if you had this kind of semblance or this kind of idea, this vague understanding that canines were useful or helpful, you know, in therapy, um, at this point, we, we know that unequivocally that the, the canines are absolutely affecting our biology and are affecting our, our hearts and, and impacting us in ways that helps us to regulate. So, you know, if you, if you have a practice or if you have, you know, if you are in a residential facility, you know, integrating canines is into your, uh, into your facilities and your practice, I think is a great, great tool. Awesome. So I know I just want to wrap up and we'll have a few minutes. We've got about 10 minutes left, maybe to field some questions. So just the takeaways are thinking about relationship and regulation, how those canines, especially we've had the privilege, um, Scott and I, to treat some pretty acute uh, dysregulation with kids, severe trauma, um, those types of things, 
we know this works. So looking at relational regulation, how that is now accessibly transferred to secure attachment figures. And that's really done through looking at the physiology of regulating the heart. And that's a practice that we can actually do. We know breathing, the diaphragm is actually the conduit, the only conduit to really control our central nervous system, mm. our autonomic nervous system, which is really fascinating. We can't think our way out of how our nervous system responds. And like it or not, our neuroception, our nervous system works, reacts way before our perception or our cognitive mind does. So this is really, really so important for us to hold. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Sabrina, any questions that we can answer? A few people have had questions regarding how to get more information on heart math and heart rate variability. I think that was an interesting concept for some of our attendees today. Absolutely. Um, I can share a website if that would be helpful. Yes. Um, so I would just go to, do you want me to just put it in the chat here? Yeah, you can just put it in the chat and then I will also be sending out like a closing thank you uh, email that will have some additional information. So I'll put, put that in there too. I would just check out that site. Um, a lot of the information that I talked about today with regards to the heart comes from that group. Um, and they also will sell the technology. So if you really were interested in the technology and there's a bunch of different um, companies out there that have started to utilize this, this heart rate variability um, but I, I recommend the heart math. They've been around for such a long time. Scott, then, did you put, thank you for doing that. Did you put the link in the chat? Some people are saying they're having a hard time seeing it. Oh, it might oh I might've sent it just to Alicia. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Let me try that again. Alicia, you have some proprietary info there. There we go. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And then I think we have time for one more question. Um, I don't know if people want to continue to put their questions in. I'll give you like two more seconds. I do have um, some others from before. Some people were asking about the ages of the dogs and if there's any correlation between ages. And, um, you know, I know when I visited Kalo, sometimes there's puppies sometimes, which is always oh, yeah. really fun. And if there's any difference in the impact based on the age of the canine and the work that we do. So I, I don't have any data about that, but I do have some experiences with that. And um, my experience with the puppies is that um, the puppies are just, just wonderful. You know, you just, um, you see a puppy just kind of walking around and um, instantly there's this gravity towards them with both the students and the staff. Um, but when it comes to certain things like, uh, like neurofeedback, um, you know, in my department, we don't like the puppies because they take a lot of responsibility. <laughs> um, but just integrated into the milieu, they are just a delight, um, absolutely a delight. And um, but they're their responsibility. So the, the girls tend to have a lot of. Um, initially, they they gravitate towards them, and then over time, they're like, ah, I don't think I want the puppy anymore. <laughs> and then they'll they'll select a, an older dog. So I think it's a great question, Sabrina, to build on that. I, I think what's interesting, is especially when we're talking about children, clients with severe trauma, especially early, early developmental trauma, puppies are interesting because if you look at the evolution, what, what's happened, a puppy is so cute and instantly activates our attachment system. Puppies activate our attachment system and they're so cute and we're drawn to them on a DNA level that it makes all of their tough stuff, their biting, their pooping, their peeing, all of that stuff, it, it actually makes it endurable because they've activated our attachment system, which we're inclined to nurture. What's fascinating that we've seen is what? Kids with severe trauma will either gravitate really towards it or reject it. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating because that sense of vulnerability, there can be some projection that if they were if they have abandonment issues or neglect or severe developmental trauma, they'll actually push the puppy away and say, I don't, because it's, it's too neurobiologically threatening to go towards that. So sometimes older dogs are actually a little bit safer for them. So we know that exposing clients to this whole range of even the dogs giving birth 
throughout the lifespan of the canine is really healthy for them in a total thing. But we need to be sensitive and attuned to the fact that sometimes, a lot of times, trauma is manifest in how they react towards the canines, just like how they do with people. I am so intrigued and I know that we're like cutting it so short, but maybe in like one minute, you can answer this follow-up question. So are the canines assigned in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the students at Kalo or does a given canine like work with more than one student at various times? Do you want to answer it, Scott? Yeah. So um, the system that we have in place is we do have that some of the canines do have accessibility to a lot of the students, but then there is an there is an option for our kids to actually adopt. And a lot of our kids here actually are adopted themselves. So it adds just kind of another layer to their development and their healing process when they get the opportunity to, to, to adopt a canine themselves. So it becomes incredibly profound. So the, the answer to your question is both. We do have some of our dogs that, that work with all the students, and then we have some of the dogs that become exclusive. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Rob, for being incredible team members um, and pivoting last minute. We hope that you found this presentation extremely helpful. And if you have any questions, I will be sending out a follow-up email so you'll know uh, where to find me. But we hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you all so much again and have a great day. Thank you.